Hey guys, this is Joe from True Guide Lures. A um, little bit different format than our, our usual meetings from Muskies Inc. Um, I was asked to do a seminar today on bait building. Um, I would love to be with all of you guys in person, but obviously that's not going to happen uh, with the pandemic and uh, you know, everything else going on. Uh, so I thought I'd mix things up today. I thought really long and hard about um, how exactly I wanted to do this without people asking me questions to answer uh, in, the, in the spur of the moment. Um, which we will do that after um, after the video I'm filming right now. Um, so I kind of thought the best way to do it was just build a lure with you guys. Like start from scratch, we'll, we'll build a wood lure um, and we'll go after the wood lure and how to turn that maybe into a resin lure and how to maybe turn it into a rubber lure too, who knows. Um, but first I want to talk a little bit about why, um, why you should consider making your own lures. One, obviously right now, it's winter here in Minnesota. It's cold, right? So unless you ice fish, you know, we're sitting here and we're looking at pictures. We're on the forum boards. Uh, we're on Facebook. We're on Instagram, uh, TikTok, whatever it might be. And we're looking at pictures of all these fish that were caught in the past season. And, you know, we're dreaming about fishing next year. Um, making lures is a great way to spend your time. Uh, you can think about all those fish you're going to catch on lures you're building. Um, but obviously, too, right now, we have the pandemic going on. And so everyone's looking for a hobby to do right now. Um, I know for a fact that, that uh, hand-making lures, uh, bait building is huge right now. A lot of people have taken it up. Um, my company has been doing great. Uh, the, my epoxy business, um, I sell epoxy for lure makers and I can't keep the stuff in stock. So I know people are definitely doing it out there. Um, also just the sheer amount of, of um, pages out there, um, hashtags on Instagram, um, all the stuff that has to pertain to lure making is just exploded. We're definitely in a little bit of a renaissance of, of beautiful handmade fishing lures right now. So it'd be a great time for you guys to start making your own lures. If nothing else, it's a great hobby, like I said, but you know, you might be able to make a little extra income out of it too. You know, I do it full time now, which I never thought in a million years that I'd be making lures full time uh, and making a living out of it, you know, and who knew that that was going to happen. Um, it started just with a piece of wood and a wood rasp. And uh, you know, now things obviously have changed quite a bit and I'm designing lures for other companies and I've got my own gig too. Um, but maybe that's you, maybe you will do it full time sometime and do what you love. Um, but we have to start first, right? So let's not put the cart before the horse. Um, so let's just talk really quick about things you can do before we jump in here and we start making a lure together. Um, there are so many, so many, places you can reference lures right now. Um, matter of fact, uh, let's go on Instagram right now and let's just type in bait building. So bait building, more than 10,000 posts, I think it says, right? So if you go on bait building, all this stuff comes up. You know, you have tons of different references, videos, guys showing you how to make lures, just stuff to get you stoked, right? There's all sorts of, oh, that's a really cool one actually. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff on here. I look on here, Quite a bit just to find things that kind of get me inspired right so let's just click something here who's this guy oh pine slopes so you know cool color right cool shape of a lure cool eyes um you can go in here and get totally inspired and uh, you can find something you might want to make right or something that gets you inspired to make your own or um let's be really honest here we're musky fishermen right so we have a lot of time to think on the water about why the fish didn't eat why we didn't see any fish, you know, what we could have done uh, to make those fish show up or those fish bite or to replicate something that just took place that was, you know, you just caught a fish or something cool happened. Um, that's where a lot of the good ideas for making lures come from too. And I'll tell you, that's where most of mine come from. You can always tell where I'm fishing or how I'm fishing um, by the new releases that come out um, the year after the season, right? So, it, you know, no secret, I fish Lake Minnetonka a lot. Right. And as the water is cleared up, you'll see that my lures have gone from kind of up in that upper, uh, you know, five foot layer when it was all milfoil and a little bit, uh, a little bit um, darker water to now I've got baits that are super weighted that you can fish down 20 feet at the base of the coontail or wherever it might be. You know, I still make the other baits too, but you can kind of see the progression of how things change based on where I fish and colors too. You know, went from brighter colors, now more natural colors, more blues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we have a lot of time to think about um, about what we could do differently while we're on the water. You know, most guys, bass guys, they catch fish all the time. You know, they don't have time to make cool lures because they're always catching fish. Us, on the other hand, have lots of time to think about making some pretty cool lures. So um, 
let me tell you what started me on making lures actually because it's kind of funny you, it, along those same lines um when i first made my first lure i think it was 1987 or 88 and it wasn't it wasn't for muskies it was for um walleyes of all things too don't judge me anyway um i was fishing below a dam and we had caught a bunch of uh, walleyes nice ones too um uh, the day before and when we went home and i filleted them up and you know i was checking their stomach to see what was in there um you know and i opened up four of the fish that i caught and all four of them had baby blackbirds i think they were blackbirds i know that i look back they might have been voles or something like that but still really weird right like i still to this day i've never seen that um but i thought at the time oh, they're eating blackbirds you know and there was a big flood that had taken place above the dam um, about a week before and it was still pretty flooded when we were fishing it and my theory was um, that some nest or something had happened and fell in the water and they washed over the dam and the, the fish were feeding on that and so there were no lures that looked like blackbirds which coincidentally there is now today which is kind of funny um, but I wanted to make my own right and so I had no experience in making lures really you know there was nothing out there that showed you how to make lures there might have been a book or two but you know this is a, this is a long time ago um, but we happen to have a piece of balsa wood at home um, because my uh, my dad or my uncle, someone in the family, um, had made a balsa wood RC airplane. Yeah, dad, if you're watching this, remember you couldn't find the RC airplane when you're looking for it? It was because I took it apart and I used the balsa wood to make a fishing lure. I was 17, okay? Give me some slack. Anyway, so I got the piece of balsa wood and I kind of carved it in the shape of a bird with a beak. Um, I got some wire and I made a little wire harness into it. Um, had no idea how I was going to put this thing together. Uh, I think I added a lead sinker to, to it to weight it. I mean, just kind of guessing. I had a diving lip on it that I'd, I'd um, I destroyed a rapala. And I, oh, that's where I got the wire from. I destroyed a rapala and I took the wire hanger out of the rapala and I put it in this piece of balsa. Um, and then my mom had a black feather boa that she had had from Halloween. And she was a witch. I took a bunch of feathers off of that boa and uh, not knowing how else to attach these feathers to this piece of balsa, um, I used Elmer's glue. So I glued the, the feathers onto the, onto the piece of balsa, painted the balsa black, and the beak was orange, uh, or the tip of it was orange, it looked like a beak. Um, and I put the feathers on it, so a diving lip, I attached the hooks to it, um, and lo and behold, I caught a bunch of smallmouth and two walleyes on it. Um, it didn't last more than you know, about a half hour or so, um, but I caught fish on it, and it, I was stoked. I mean, I was so pumped that I had caught fish on the only, you know, the only lure I'd ever made in my life. Um, and it was, you know, such a weird lure and such a niche. I thought I was totally onto something. Um, but that's what got me making lures. It was to fulfill a need that I had seen um, that no one was making anything that existed to fill that niche, right? And so um, that still to this day is really the most compelling reason for me to make baits, it might be you uh, too, might not be, you might just want a hobby. Uh, but for me, it's always trying to think of, we have this niche and no one's making the bait or not making it the way I want, I could do that. And uh, so anyway, um, that really kickstarted things for me. You know, I didn't make musky lures uh, per se until about 2000 or so when my, my oldest daughter was born. And then I really in earnest started making musky lures. And I dabbled and made some stuff in between that time frame, of course, but, um, really didn't go hardcore again until about 2000 um and by 2003 i was selling uh selling muscularers but um that same, same drive is still what keeps me going today and keeps me loving making lures you know i every year i make a ton of weird ones to fill niches and people look at them and probably think i'm insane um but i see that lure and i think yeah that's the one that's gonna that catch the you know the 55 incher or whatever it might be um and i will say one other thing too about making baits you know, I come at it from a little bit different angle. You know, I want to I wanna build that bait that doesn't exist to fill a niche that I want. Uh, and I'm definitely a form over function kind of guy. Like, I like my baits to kind of aesthetically look cool, to me at least, right? Um, so I have, a, I have a point of view of what I want them to look like, how the shapes are going to look, how the curves are going to look. And I kind of come at it from more of, I guess, an artist kind of uh, point of view, right? Um, but then you think of other people out there that come from more of a, you know, the mechanical kind of view or uh, point of view, I should say, or um, like an engineer point of view, um, like Larry Dahlberg. Larry's a good friend of mine, right? Larry and I could sit there and we can make lures together and he would be doing really formulaic, like, you know, 
you guys may have seen him do it, but he'll he'll make a chart and he's formulating out how the curves are going to be affected by the water resistance at certain temperatures. And, you know, in the meantime, I'm like, well, this looks cool. And I'd, I'll make something that way. So there's a little bit of something for everybody in making fishing lures, whether you're coming out from the artistic side and you just want to make some cool looking lures um, and you want to paint um, or you're coming out more from that from a lake kind of um, side or both you know uh, I, I'm kind of fascinated by both personally with the art side being kind of more of my natural um, inclinations um, but there is a little bit of something for everybody in there and you can catch fish and um, you know again kill some time in the winter you know hang out in your basement or your garage have a heater though um, you got to get away from people right now as it is anyway I and mean, frankly most of us bait builders don't even know there's a you know a, a stay at home order or whatever it might be because that's all we do in the winter anyway pandemic what anyway so today we're going to build a lure from scratch um, i'm going to walk you through a bunch of different options too i'll show you the way i do it and i'll give you a bunch of options on how you might go home and do it yourself so the first thing we're going to do today is decide what kind of lure we want to do um, and i'll just tell you i'm going to do a top water it's the easiest type of lure to start with um, you can do it at home, you can make your own top water. You don't even need lead or weights or anything if you if you don't want. Um, so today we're going to do a top water. I'm going to use uh, cedar wood. That's what I work in, so I have a lot of cedar laying around. Um, for those of you who um, don't have access to wood, um, I would just say go over to your Ace Hardware store and get some basswood. Don't do balsa. Balsa is a little bit too. It's not very sturdy, especially for muskies. Basswood is totally fine. Uh, and the nice thing about going to say Ace Hardware to start your kind of passion of fishing lures is that um, when you get basswood, it's kiln dried. And pretty much all basswood that you buy anywhere in the stores are kiln dried. I think the, the moisture, kind I won't bore you with that, but the, there's no moisture in it really, or very little, I should say, um, versus going to say Menards or something like that at Home Depot and, and getting a piece of cedar, that's sticker dried. Um, sticker dried just means that they have these, um, they stack the wood stickers and um, they're drying it that way. It's not kiln dried. So there's a lot of moisture in that wood, or potentially there could be. Um, and if you make a lure out of that, not knowing how much moisture is in that wood, you could, you could, you know, run your lure ASAP. You touch his water and it could crack or whatnot. So for your first lure, just to get you, uh, you know, comfortable doing what you need to do to make a lure uh, and have you be able to use it for a while, right? Um, I do recommend just go get a piece of basswood. Or, you know, if you know someone who has kiln dried wood, Heck yeah, grab some of that for sure too. Um, but anyway, that's just my opinion. Of course, whatever you got, go for it. Uh, I know my friend um, Klaus in Sweden just made these real, or it was a little while ago, I guess, but he made these really, really cool dive and rise baits out of pallet wood. And, you know, he loves the fact that he makes baits out of really weird wood, right? And, you know, he does uh, hand rails. Uh, he's, you know, wooden hand rails he'd make cool baits out of. Um, this happened to be pallet wood that was pretty dried and he made some really cool lures out of that too so you know whatever you have accessible of course go for it if you have to go buy something that's what i recommend um second you gotta decide like what shape do you want to do for today we're going to make a walk the dog top water lure there's all sorts of different ways you can make that bait you can make it cylindrical um you know take a dowel from a hardware store and you can just you know you can take the edges and you can just carve the edges so they're round and there you go. You got one, right? Um, I'm going to make mine a little bit different. Um, I have a couple customers who have been asking me to do like a throwback lure. Um, throwback, not physically, but like back to 2006. Um, I had a, a walk the dog lure that um, today is a lot different than it was back then. Um, but I have the template still from 2006. And they asked me if I could make some. That's what we're going to do. And so um, templates, by the way, can be anything from piece of paper right this is how most mine start out paper when I kind of get my idea um, then you can go into all sorts of different stuff right so I got templates of the yin yang I I probably have four or five hundred templates actually in a box um, uh, let's see anyway so these guys are all carved out templates on here right stuff like big pike lure you know sorry 14 inch pike glider and then I've got you know the different weights and stuff that work on it anyway just so I know for the future but again for today we're gonna do a walk the dog really simple so I found oh sorry 2004 so I found my 2004 heckler body shape um, those of you who do collect my lures or fish my lures um, will know that it's quite different quite a bit different from the shape from today anyway so 
this is what we're going to do. So I've got a piece of kiln dried cedar right here. First thing we're going to do, slap the sucker on there. Uh, get it where you guys can see it. And nothing too fancy here. This is the official pencil of, I'm a serious builder. I got a flat pencil. Anyway, um, take your pencil. shape. I don't know if you guys can see that. It's pretty light, but my shape is ready to be cut out. So we're going to take this sucker over to my tool shed and uh, we're going to cut it out. So follow me. Okay, so here we go. I'm at my, uh, I'm at my bandsaw right now. The thing is, you could easily do this with just a jigsaw um, or you know, you could do it with a handsaw too. It doesn't really matter. You could you could find a way to make this work. My first lures were cut out um, literally with just a handsaw and then a wood rasp to shape them. So I've got some tools. You might not have them. So don't let that deter you at all. Um, the premise is the same for no matter what you decide to um, shape your lures with. So I'm just going to give you some ideas here. Speaking of weird niche lures, <laughs> this is on my, I kind of forgot about this one. So you guys all know Paul Hartman. So Paul Hartman um, schooled my friend York and I this fall uh, fishing um, out of our kayaks, actually. We did a lot of kayak fishing this year on reapers, right? So if you remember those old, you know, baits from uh, 1980s, 90s, um, quite a bit smaller than this. And uh, he had me inspired to make a wood reaper bait out of um, rubber uh, or, you know, plastisol, like a, like a bulldog. And so this is going to be, uh, let me turn up the lights a little bit this is going to be um, the reaper bait. This is the master. Uh, I'll make a mold for this, and then it'll be an injection um, plastisol, you know, rubber bait. So quite a bit bigger. Anyway, it's going to turn out pretty cool, actually. You guys can see that at all. So anyway, this is going to be Hartman's Reaper. I need a good name. If you guys can think of a funny name that I can call this, um, they're not going to be for sale or anything like that. It's kind of made it for friends. So anyway, a big 10-inch uh, reaper, maybe bigger than 10-inch. Anyway. Speaking of weird baits that fill niches, this just happened to be on my on my bandsaw. So uh, I'm going to fire up the dust collectors. It's going to be kind of loud here for a little bit. I apologize. Maybe I'll do some soothing music over that for you if I can figure out how to do it on the video. Um, be right back. So what I was saying before 
is yeah, I use a, a bandsaw for this. Mine's a pretty big bandsaw. Um, you could certainly, if you have access to a bandsaw, a uh, bandsaw is smaller, use that. Um, certainly use just a handsaw. Um, you might not even need a saw at all, right? So if you do like a wood dowel or something like that, but for today, we use the bandsaw. So here's our basic shape, right? So yeah, pretty close. We got a little work to do still though. So at this point in the game, you have a couple options. Your shape is cut out, right? So now it's gonna be how to shape it. Cause right now it's just a, you know, just a square piece of wood that kind of looks like a fishing lure. And so at this point in the game, you can do a couple options. I know a lot of guys who will use a wood rasp and they'll just rasp away at it right to the edges. That's how I started. I mean, it's really easy to do. Um, available at all sorts of you know hardware stores. Not um, not super expensive. Um, you know, you could do, you guys probably know Greg Nimmer of Nimmer uh, Swimmer Musculars. And Greg, Greg uses a, a hatchet. Or no, what if he uses? He uses a... Um, Machete. So if you've seen his videos, it's gnarly. And, and kids, I don't recommend you if you're starting to making lures to use a machete like Greg. Greg only has one finger left and one leg is definitely shorter than the other. So it's definitely dangerous. So I don't recommend that. Anyway, he does it. So um, if that's the only thing you have access to and you're really good with a machete for some really weird reason, uh, I guess go for it. Um, but I recommend using sandpaper, a wood rasp, a wood file, or you get something like these little guys here. These are these are awesome flex cut knives. Um, I don't use them necessarily to to do the actual shaping, but you can see how easy these guys cut the wood, and they cut it so easy. So you could go through here, and you could just you could just I don't know if you guys can see it. You could just easily whittle your lure down to nothing with a flex cut knife. Um, they sell these all over. You can get them on Amazon. Um, there's all sorts of sets of them too. Um, I use mine more for uh, carving details like gill plates and stuff like that on lures I'm trying to make extra fancy. Uh, that's why I use them for. But there's plenty of guys that use them for the actual shaping of the lure. Uh, and like I said, I mean, it, it's just, you know, this guy's not even that sharp of one, but it just takes the wood right off. Um, not a problem at all. So flex cut knives are a good option too. Um, and like I said before, just sandpaper would probably work too. So for today, we're going to do it the way I do it. Um, I definitely use just sandpaper. Um, but I use it a little bit differently than just a piece of skin paper. So let's go. I'll show you what I do here.
Okay, now I'm going to come back into it and just give it a thinner sand. Some 220. Can make it look a little bit more like a lure. Nothing too exciting here at all. Uh, but this gets rid of some of the machine marks. It's a lure blank. There. Oh, looking pretty good. Go back to the table. So now I have the, you know, pretty much a complete lure blank, and it took nothing. It was fast for me to make this for sure. Again, you know, I've got the tools for it for sure. I've got the dust collectors, I've got the, the Ed Sander, and a bandsaw, but you don't need any of that stuff. I mean, you could do this easily with sandpaper, and so, you know, I can just maybe do it a little bit faster than, than you would do it with a piece of sandpaper. Um, another tool that would be good to use too would be like a little palm sander. You can get those pretty cheap, a little Ryobi one or something for 25, 30 bucks. Um, you could easily do that. A lot of guys router their baits. You know, I, I don't really use routers too much, um, especially when I'm especially when I'm doing a, a bait that you know I haven't done for a long time. Some of my production ones I do router really quick, but for the most part, almost all my baits are done the exact same way I just showed you. You know, a um, couple exceptions might be when I'm doing. Um, yeah, I mean. I don't even know. Almost everything, almost everything I do is, you know, you can, you can see the edges. It's almost this is a different bait, obviously, but um, almost everything goes right in the edge sander. For me, that's kind of one of my signatures. Uh, I feel like it makes my bait look more organic, right? You don't have those routered over, router over edges. You're not constricted. Um, again, this is, in my opinion, you're not constricted to the router bit. Um, you know, you can make the shapes almost anything you want, um, and to me, that's really appealing. Um, it definitely holds me back sometimes when I know I should be using a router. It could be so much easier, um, but instead I'm, I'm thinking the head and I do it this way. Anyway, so now I've got my bait and now it's time to add weight. This particular one is going to take some weight uh, just because of the way the shape is. Um, the heckler, um, that's what this style is, cuts the water and when it cuts the water it turns on its side slightly. So it walks the dog, right, and it walks the dog, it also flashes on its side too, quite a bit. So maybe not really much that I'm showing in here, but anyway. Um, it's a great big fish bait. I've caught a lot of big fish. That one back there was actually caught in a heckler. Uh, that's from the uh, uh, Frank Schneider tournament a couple years ago, actually. So that was, um, we had a register as a 53 and a half, but it's because my buddy cut the tail off in the pitcher at 53 and a half. It's actually a 54 and a half. That's caught in a heckler. Um, I've caught a 55 on the heckler. Um, really good walk the dog bait. But uh, anyway, I'm not here to sell you guys on the heckler. Just know this shape is going to need weight. So luckily for me, um, way back when I made this shape in 2004, actually, I thought it was six, but it's four, um, I put exactly where the weight goes and the hook hangers are all in my template. So after a lot of trial and error, which is actually part of the fun too, um, I know exactly where I've got it, where I want it. Now, when I started experimenting originally um, with this bait, and any bait in particular, some of it's guesswork of where you're going to start putting the weight. As you get better at this, the guesswork becomes much more educated guess, uh, and you don't really have to, um, you don't have to fuddle around quite as much, right? Um, but at any rate, this bait, when I first started making it, probably had weight in a bunch of different positions to try to figure out where, um, where it was going to work best, or where I thought it would work best. All the baits worked. Every one I made with different weights in them worked, and they all probably catch fish. But I specifically was looking for something really specific to happen to the bait, and so after trial and error, I settle on the weight going in a certain area. So pretty easy, take the template, gonna put it on the bait, and we're gonna say right where the hook hangers go. Let's see if you guys see this. Hook hangers here, hook hangers here, and the weight goes right here. 
All right, so I've got the weight and the hook hangers all matched out on here. I know that's going to go. Um, let me go show you that. And now, uh, note of caution here. I'm going to pour lead into this one. So for you guys at home, um, especially you younger guys, um, one, make sure you get your parents' permission to do this and make sure you have a lead smelter too, right? Two, lead's nasty stuff. It's really nasty. I am starting to work my way away from lead and getting much more into, um, into tungsten and zincs. Um, but right now, lead is the most economical, uh, even though it's fairly expensive, but it's the easiest to work with. If you're gonna work in lead, you need a respirator, you need ventilation, which I have both in my shop, um, and you need to wear gloves and you need to clean up. So just word of caution, if you're gonna use lead, you know, take it serious, this stuff is nasty. And especially if you're younger, um, you know, I'm older now, the damage is done, obviously. Um, you younger guys, uh, you don't wanna risk your health, okay? So if you're gonna use lead, just make sure you follow precautions. Uh, I'm sure you know it's nasty stuff, but that's what we're gonna use today. If you have another way of doing it, that's awesome. We could easily drill out a lure when you're first starting, and you could put a tungsten weight in here, or a pre-molded lead weight, would be super easy too. It just so happens that on this particular one, because it's back from 2004, um, I actually have the lead hole marked and the drill bit with the um, stop on it made specifically for this. So that's what we're gonna do today. So, and it's the most common too. So um, let's go do that. Okay, here we go, pouring lead. Not too exciting. I did find another lure that's kind of cool. This is why it's fun to make your own lures. I wanted a big twitch bait, and so I just made a master and made some resin ones of this. Kind of cool. We'll see. It works awesome, so we'll see if we catch fish next year with it. Any anyway, rate, important to have a good pair of gloves, good mask. You can hear the air handling unit in the background, too, I'm sure. Back from pouring the lead, that was the most exciting part, I know. A lot of you guys probably had to take a break after that because it was so exhilarating. Anyway, lead is in the bait. The bait is now ready to seal. Um, I'll fill in that lead hole with a little bit of um, a little bit of wood putty. Uh, I know some guys who fill them in with five minute epoxy, whatever you want, but I'll cover that up. Uh, and then I'm gonna seal this bait and I'm going to paint this bait. I'm not gonna walk you through that. I know a lot of you probably would like to see that. Um, but that part's really tedious and it's pretty long. Um, so you can ask me questions at the end of all this. Um, if you have any questions about what types of paints or airbrushes or whatever you want to get into, um, I'm happy to talk about that for sure. Uh, but it would take a long time to make a video. Um, one thing I didn't note on here, <clears throat> I didn't show you, I didn't show myself drilling the hole for this. Didn't think it'd be all that exciting. Uh, this one only takes one lead weight, which is really nice. Um, you know, my gliders take up to 14. So this one's really easy. Um, but one thing that I do do that um, if you're going to be making one lure here and there for yourself, you probably don't have to worry about this. But if you want to make multiples, um, this is actually the drill bit um, with the stop on it right here that I have for that specific bait. So whenever I make a bait, no matter what your model it is, I have the drill bits all put aside with the templates too. So when I go back to them, there's no guesswork to how much lead or know how, how much you know how deep the holes have to be and so um, little drill stops like this make a big difference so this bait is basically forever immortalized because I can go back to it like I am right now you know um, what it says 2004 so I'm back to it now you know years later 16 years later whatever it might be and um, 17 years what the heck anyway um, I can come back to it much much later and um, no guesswork because there's no way I'd remember where that lead goes and I wouldn't remember how deep it goes. I wouldn't even remember necessarily where the hook hangers would go. I could probably figure a lot of it out, um, but I don't have to, it's all right here. And so if you are gonna make baits, um, multiples, if you wanna get into this uh, in the future and maybe make a little extra income or whatnot, um, drill stops. And then I also label them too. You probably can't see this on here, but I've got the year labeled on here and what specific lure make also. In case it gets separated from the template 
where I keep my templates. So a little tip for you guys for sure. So um, I skipped over that, but it probably is a good piece of information for some of you. Okay, so I'm gonna go off and I'm gonna paint this bait now. Um, hopefully I can get the whole thing painted up by the time the actual seminar takes place on the 12th. Um, I think I can, it's gonna be pretty close. Um, anyway, um, I'll be back. Okay guys, a little bit of an update here. So I've been painting and uh, here's where we're at so far with the lure. Not done yet, I'm gonna add some eyeballs to it. I've got it all signed in there. It says throwback 2006 to 2021. Um, anyway, you can kind of see in there what that base turned out like. It's looking pretty good so far. You probably can't see all the depth in that yet, but anyway, it's gonna be a pretty cool lure. So anyway, it's all done. Hopefully I get it done by um, uh, by the seminar, I got two days. I got to slap some eyes on it, get a few more coats of epoxy. Um, but I think I can show you the real deal um, in person, actually, at the seminar. So that's where we're at. Getting closer.